But I'm Ernie Bauer. I'm the um, Sumitro Chair for Southeast Asian Studies. Uh, and I also am the co-director of uh, the Pacific Partners Initiative here at CSIS. And it's under that rubric, the Pacific Partners Initiative, uh, and that we are gathered here today to hear from His Excellency uh, Tommy uh, Remengasau, uh, the president of Palau. Uh, and we are deeply honored that the president uh, selected uh, CSIS uh, for the opportunity to make a policy talk about um, uh, the global uh, maritime uh, situation in the Pacific. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the Pacific is, uh, let me just invite uh, Assistant Secretary McGinn to join us here. Sorry, sir, we uh, getting started here on time. Uh, I know the traffic out there is uh, difficult. Welcome. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we are pleased to welcome you to the Banyan Tree Leadership Forum here at CSIS. Um, today's program will include a, a speech by the President and then an expert panel who I will introduce after the President speaks. And then we will open the floor to questions and answers after, uh, after the President's remarks and the, the panel, uh, will, each of the panel will make brief uh, remarks after the President speaks. So I hope you'll uh, participate with some good questions, uh, some observations. Uh, we have a large online uh, audience, too, uh, on CSIS, uh, hashtag CSIS Live and at CSIS. So welcome to our online viewers. Um, let me introduce uh, a man who has uh, stood up for uh, the rights, not only of his country, but of, uh, of Pacific countries who are trying to um, protect their maritime rights and, uh, and environment. Uh, Tommy, uh, Tommy uh, Romengasau is the eighth president of the Republic of Palau. He's the first Palauan to be elected three times, president three times, so he's obviously much beloved by his country. Uh, he's first elected to president, president in the year 2000, again in 2004, and there are term limits in Palau, so he uh, took a break and was a senator <laughs> for, uh, for a term, and then was reelected again um, in 2012. Please join me in welcoming His Excellency uh, Tommy Romengasau. <laughs> Ernie, Ernie, thank you for, very much for your kind uh, introduction. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for that warm welcome and for taking time out of your busy schedules uh, to be here today. Let me also uh, thank the Center for Strategic and International Studies and the Pew Charitable Trust for the opportunity to discuss the important role Palau has in conservation and security in the Pacific, as well as the strong partnership we share with the United States. And I, of course, would like to recognize a few individuals who are here with us uh, today. Former Senator from Virginia, John Warner, uh, who as a distinguished Pew Fellow and regular at CSIS functions helped uh, bring this event together. Thank you, sir, for being with us this, and sharing those memorable uh, highlights uh, with us this morning. I know many of you were expecting Senator McCain today and probably scratching your heads about the connection between Palau and the Senator. I just met with Senator McCain on Capitol Hill and he sends his regrets that he could not be here with us today. Senator McCain is a, a good friend of Palau. In 2014, during his third visit to Palau, our Congress, at my request, uh, made Senator McCain an honorary citizen of Palau. Senator McCain uh, understands the ge geostrategic importance of a strong, U.S.-Palau relationship. And so I look forward to discussing this further with the panel and all of you today. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I have said time and time again that for Palau, the economy is our environment, and the environment is our economy. Today, I would like to expand on this by stating that the environment is our security, and security is our environment. Protecting Palau's marine environment is about much more than conservation of fish and corals. Ocean conservation is food security. It is cultural security. It is economic security. And yes, ocean conservation is national security. Palau truly is the crossroads of security and conservation in the Pacific, and our efforts within our waters contributes to regional security. How exactly is it that conservation and security work together? Many call Palau and our neighbors in the Pacific small island states. I have always referred to us as big ocean states since Palau's sovereign marine territory is nearly the size of the great state of Texas. By proposing to transform our EEG, Exclusive Economic Zone, into the Palau National Marine Sanctuary, we are not just protecting our environment. We are enhancing our maritime domain awareness and our partnerships to monitor and enforce our EEG. And it's important to note that we're not just trying to stop illegal fishing. We are also defending against other transnational crimes like drug smuggling and human trafficking. I'm going to take a pause here because I see that my good friend, Dr. Sylvia Earl, has just walked into the room. Uh, she's a mermaid, <laughs> and I like to refer to her as her deepness, her deepness. Thank you, Sylvia, for joining us this morning. Anyway, I, I know these are priorities for the United States, too. Palau has always been and continues to be a strong partner with the United States. Our two countries share a special relationship. I believe Palau's interests in global security are well aligned with those of the United States, both in our region and globally. This steadfast support is not required by our compacts, but it is a fact. Our country is located, as you know, strategically in an area of the Pacific Ocean near Guam and the Philippines. Because of this and our strong partnership with the United States, Palau is an anchor for the United States in a key security zone that safeguards U.S. interests in the Pacific. Palau does not maintain its own military forces. Under the terms of our compacts with your government, we rely on the United States entirely for our national defense. At the same time, our citizens are eligible to serve in the United States Armed Forces. In fact, Palawan citizens volunteer in the U.S. military is at a rate higher than any individual U.S. state. Palawan sons and daughters of many government officials and of ordinary Palawan citizens. And as I say this, I know that our own ambassador to Washington, D.C. has two sons and a daughter serving in the U.S. military. <laughs> I have a nephew also who served in the Iraq War. And uh, I'm sure you ask any Palawan, they probably have a, a son, a daughter, a cousin. Uh, but 
it is a privilege and an honor that we take seriously. And we're proud to stand alongside with the sons and daughters of the United States of America. Under the terms, excuse me, Palawan sons and daughters of many government officials and of ordinary Palawan citizens have served honorably in U.S. military units over the past decades and most recently in Afghanistan and, and Iraq. So we also contribute in this very important way to the national security of the United States. Now, under the terms of the U.S. Palau Compact, Palau agrees to be off limits to the military forces of any nation except the United States. The United States enjoy exclusive defense access to Palawan waters, lands, airspace, and its exclusive economic zone. This exclusive access gives the United States a key stronghold from which to guard its long-term defense interests in the region. The importance of our strong relationship with the United States goes beyond having full and exclusive DOD access to Palau. Indeed, Palau works closely with the United States to detect and combat international crime and terror too. Many here in the United States are not aware that in 2009, at the request of the U.S. government, Palau resettled six detainees from Guantanamo prison at a time when few other countries were willing to step up to this responsibility as a defense partner of the United States. More importantly for the topic I wish to raise today, Palau was the first island partner to sign the U.S. Coast Guard ship rider and shipboarding agreements that bolster law enforcement in the vast Pacific region. Now I am here to sound an alarm. There is a growing law enforcement problem in the Pacific region, which is actually a national security issue for Palau, and we need concerted U.S. government and specifically U.S. Defense Department and U.S. Coast Guard assistance. We believe this is something that the U.S. is obligated to provide because of our compact agreement and our special relationship. Our economy, our defense, and our livelihood in Palau are dependent upon our coastal and ocean natural resources. Our coral reefs, fisheries, and our clean natural environment mean everything, everything to our people. But we are facing a growing and dire threat from illegal fishing within our waters. Folks, just in recent months, many illegal fishing vessels from Vietnam and other nations have been apprehended in our waters. These pirate fishermen are stealing our precious natural resources, the engine of our economy and the lifeblood of our culture. And there is little that we can do about it now because of the sheer size of our EEG. The truth is, we don't even know the extent of the problem, but we believe it is large and growing. We are located in an important area for tuna fishing. There are many fleets, many fishing fleets from countless nations fishing in the waters bordering on Palau's EEG. Pressure to feed growing populations throughout Asia and globally has led to vast overfishing in the Pacific and to a wave of illegal fishing and even human rights violations on fishing vessels that use slave labor to carry out their crimes. We have one of the largest exclusive economic zones of any small island nation in the Pacific, indeed of any country in the world. And we would like to protect these waters from this criminal activity. But the sheer size again of the area makes that very challenging for a nation like ours that has no military capabilities. Our local law enforcement 
simply cannot tackle a job this big alone. We need a credible threat of enforcement, at least. And because illegal fishing threatens our livelihoods and our economy, not to mention our culture and way of life, it is more than just a law enforcement problem for us. It is a national security problem for Palau. And that is why we need U.S. national security assistance. To the U.S. public and even some government officials, this may seem trivial. It's just fishing. But it is not just fishing. It is criminal behavior that is having a destabilizing effect in our country and our region of the world. The U.S. Navy has been to Palau in the last year to experiment with new technologies that can provide the type of maritime domain awareness that would allow us to detect these illegal fishing operations. And the technologies worked. But after their experiments were over, the Navy left, and we have no indication that they will be back to deploy this technology to assist us. We believe these scars of illegal fishing can be eradicated. And we want to begin to tackle this problem now, before Palau's fish stocks have been completely depleted and before Palau's economy has been permanently damaged by the perpetrators of these crimes. And before our Pacific region is any more harmed by illegal fishing and human trafficking. We are mindful that the United States government, and specifically the U.S. military, is putting greater emphasis on the Pacific, the so-called pivot to the Pacific. And we know you take your compact obligations seriously. I am here ladies and gentlemen, to call on you, begin to work with our government to create a credible monitoring and enforcement capacity to rid Palau of this growing and serious threat to our security and to security throughout the Pacific. God bless the United States of America, God bless Palau, and God bless all of us here today. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President, for uh, a very strong statement, and I'm really looking forward to, uh, to the, the responses uh, and views of our panel, whom I would now like to introduce, and, and we'll, I'll introduce each of them uh, now, and then uh, if you could speak in, in turn. Um, on my far left, uh, Dennis McGinn is Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Energy, Installations, and the Environment. Uh, Mr. McGinn is uh, a former uh, Navy man, uh, he is also the uh, former president of the American Council on Renewable Energy, um, uh, which is called ACOR. Uh, so he's got uh, a great, uh, a great background to think about the environment and security. Uh, absolutely perfect uh, leader for that job. On my right uh, is Eileen Sobeck. She is the assistant administrator for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, as it's known. She oversees the management and conservation of recreational and commercial fisheries uh, and protection of maritime, uh, the maritime domain um, uh, across the United States and through our exclusive economic zones. Thank you for joining us, uh, Eileen. One, one just personal note that I loved from her, reading a little bit about her background. Now, she's a Stanford graduate, Stanford undergrad, and law but she also has a species of Pacific, uh, uh, of, named after her, um, a Pacific nudibranch, um, uh, nudibranch. Uh, it's named for her, and uh, so I think that's pretty cool. Uh, and finally, uh, on my far right, uh, at the end of the um, table here, Seth Horstmeyer, who's been a great partner in putting uh, this program together, is director of the ocean, Global Ocean Legacy program at the Pew Charitable Trusts, 
Um, Seth and his colleagues at Pew, along with Senator Warner, uh, were the ones who came to CSIS and, and made the case that, you know, um, shouldn't we talk about security and the environment in the Pacific? And, and you know, uh, Seth is influential, but when Senator Warner comes to the table, CSIS is not going to say no. Uh, and actually, I have to say that um, in, in my time uh, working with them to understand these issues and, and plan on the President's uh, talk, uh, the issue is compelling, and I, and I really appreciate you for helping us understand it more deeply. So uh, let me start uh, with um, uh, uh, Mr. McGinn, uh, and then we will move through the panel, and I'll open it up for your questions and, and observations. Sir. Thank you. It's uh, really great to be here, Mr. President. Uh, I want to start by saying uh, how much we value the uh, partnership with uh, your nation. Uh, my boss, uh, Secretary of the Navy, Ray Mabus, as you know, is uh, a frequent visitor. Perhaps if he, we can get him there one more time, he could become an honorary citizen. <laughs> well, uh, well, just an idea, just saying. But uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things I really want to start by saying is uh, how right uh, the President has in his characterization of the inextricable links between environment, economy, and national security. Not just in Palau, it's certainly uh, a, an unbelievably uh, sharp focus in Palau, but literally across the global commons called the oceans. This idea of maintaining ocean health, maintaining economic wealth, and creating more wealth in a sustainable way, and the, the national security and international security all fit together. It doesn't have to be, nor should it be, a zero-sum game where you can have a good environment, a sustainable environment, and, and uh, maybe you have to take a hit on the economy or it's going to be a, an effect somehow uh, negatively on, on national security. That is not the case. The way to get it right is, in fact, by recognizing there's a holistic solution, and if you, uh, if you start prohibiting and preventing illegal activities, illegal fishing, unreported fishing, unregulated fishing, you also leverage that, that de maritime domain awareness and the assets, assets that you're going to be using uh, to maintain that maritime domain awareness to prevent other illegal activities, and that contributes directly to national security throughout the, uh, the global oceans. We d did, in fact, as uh, the President pointed out, have a pilot program to increase mar maritime domain awareness. We had some assets. It was a collaboration from the Pacific Command, from the uh, U.S. Navy's Pacific Fleet, from the Coast Guard, and from our Office of Navy Research that brought together existing assets, off-the-shelf, if you will, assets. Some of them were land-based, sea-based, and then, of course, uh, uh, air, air assets as well. And we proved the concept that you can, in fact, increase your level of mar maritime domain awareness to detect and eventually prevent all sorts of illegal activities by bringing together this type of architecture. Mr. President, I want to assure you we will be back. Uh, we, the, the idea was... Uh, The idea of a pilot program was to learn as much as you can about the technology, about the tactics, the procedures, and, and then to uh, try to scale that up and get it in a way that is uh, most effective, most reliable, and uh, most economical. And that's the process we're going through now. Uh, one of the key players here is uh, Admiral uh, John White, our Navy oceanographer, uh, Admiral uh, Winter, our chief of naval research, and, of course, uh, someone that I'm sure you know, Mr. President, uh, Admiral Bet Bolivar, who is the uh, Pacific Command's defense representative to Palau. I will be meeting with uh, Admiral Bolivar, in fact, this afternoon uh, at 1 o'clock, and we'll be uh, continuing this conversation as she carries out her uh, role. So let me uh, conclude my opening remarks by, by simply saying the President has it right. We in the United States Navy and indeed in the United States uh, Defense Establishment understand this inextric inextricable connection and we are taking great measures to increase maritime domain awareness to prevent illegal activities of all sorts, including 
illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. Thank you. Thank you. Eileen, could we uh, turn to you now, please? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much to CIS, CSIS and Senator Warner for the invitation. Um, it's always an honor to um, be in an event with, um, with the president. And um, I, I love, uh, be, because he is one of the, the, the wisest and most progressive of, of Pacific leaders, and I, th I think everybody in this room recognizes that and, and that his remarks um, uh, show that quite clearly. And one thing I love about um, events or meetings with Pacific Island nations is that you don't have to spend a lot of time explaining um, the importance of conservation, the uh, link between coastal um, and ocean resources and the economy or our defense. It goes without saying. The island nations understand that better than anybody else in the world. Um, and the United States is a nation of islands also, even though um, uh, so some people don't realize that, but our, uh, some of our island states and our territories have uh, many of the same um, challenges and opportunities that Palau does. And so I think it's an obvious, um, easy, and um, uh, productive partnership that we have had over the long run. Um, it's also music to my ears to be in a group um, that recognizes the importance of enforcement. And um, I, I spent 25 years at the U.S. Department of Justice where I, for the most, most of that time, I supervised environmental prosecutors who prosecuted uh, violations of federal criminal environmental laws, including um, our fisheries and protected resources laws. And those are not always very popular um, actions, but I do think that if you mean it, that you mean that it's important, if it's important to conserve um, ocean resources, then you have to be willing to both have um, uh, some carrots, some inducements to good, in good behavior, but you also have to have um, a stick. Uh, the other thing we like to say at the Department of Justice is cheaters cheat. I think that that's uh, the, the shorthand for, um, for things that both uh, the President and uh, Mr. Uh, McGinn mentored, mentioned, which is people who aren't respecting fisheries laws, um, aren't, ref aren't, aren't um, reflecting human rights often, or um, other environmental pollution laws, or many of the other um, international norms that are, that are very important. Um, and so I think that making sure that the bad guys are not um, doing bad things in our, our large protected areas is, is extremely important, um, but it is also extremely challenging. We in the United States um, have some very large marine protected areas, and this administration has been instrumental in increasing those. We have um, uh, almost doubled the size of our um, marine sanctuaries, and also some of the um, large um, marine national monuments in the Pacific. Um, it is a big ocean, it is far away, um, and we have um, very few assets that can really go out that far. We're working on a lot of the new technology to identify uh, which ships are where and are they where they're supposed to be and what where they're what they're supposed doing what they're supposed to do. We do want to look out for the legitimate fishing interests in appropriate areas of our fishermen. I think that it is important to to know that there are. Um, I think that we we in the United States have some of the most sustainable fisheries in the world. Um, our fishermen have paid um, a lot in terms of holding back on fishing to rebuild our fishery stocks. So whether they're domestic stocks or highly migratory stocks um, that range into, the, in, into international waters, um, I think in appropriate areas, it is appropriate to allow appropriate fishing. But that means we've got to enforce against inappropriate fishing. Again, it is a challenge. Um, it is a challenge that we are, I think we are all working on together. I think it is a, a, a place where we are also looking to our friends at Coast Guard and the Navy to take our own enforcement officers on their, um, on their vessels and platforms of opportunity. Um, and that is, a, that is a work in progress. And I think that um, at times in the past, there has not been the kind of understanding and appreciation of our mission overlaps at the Department of Defense and um, um, some of the uh, domestic uh, conservation and management agencies. But I don't think that partnership has ever been um, closer. We've taken a lot of the work that started under um, Senator Warner, and 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 we have really a fabulous partnership for all the in all the ways that were mentioned before. We really could not do our conservation job without our partners in DoD and the Coast Guard, and um, um, many of our larger um, coastal uh, our, our larger ocean um, 
uh, monuments, sanctuaries, other marine protected areas are in areas that are sensitive even off of our own, in our own waters for defense purposes, whether it's trading exercises or, or, or whatnot. So we are always mindful of their mission and we are really um, um, excited about the fact that they uh, are respectful and helpful for ours. I also think that um, the, the cross-cutting challenges of the big issues of the day like climate change and um, sea level rise are are issues that we are all, we, we are facing here at home. Um, in Palau, you are facing it, and DOD with all of its installations is also incredibly um, interested in um, an appropriate response to that, to that challenge. Um, I, I'd just like to stop by saying that um, um, uh, I think, again, the, the, the value of these large conservation areas is something that we're we continue to learn about, we continue to um, uh, document and um, and, and, and understand the benefits of. And, and there was a milestone yesterday here in the United States where um, one of our uh, regional fishery management councils in the mid-Atlantic states um, voted to establish um, a large fishery closure area, probably one of the largest ever established, um, that cover, that closes 15 mid-Atlantic deep canyons that have a lot of very um, uh, uh, vulnerable deep water corals. Um, and the, the size that they close to fishing, the size of this, um, this area is about the size of the state of Kentucky. And this is a, this is a body that is, you know, that it, its main job is to regulate, is to, to, is to come up with recommendations that we then at the, um, at, at NOAA turn into regulations. Um, so this is fishermen imposing on themselves a closure of a sensitive area, a large sensitive area. We're talking about the size of the state of Kentucky. Um, um, voluntarily and understanding the value of that uh, um, for them and their continued economic viability. So I, I think that was a fabulous milestone to kind of underscore the intersection of conservation, economics, and national defense. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Seth, can we uh, turn to you now, please? Yeah, thank you, Ernie, and um, thank you uh, for, for co-hosting this event with us. Uh, CSIS has a, a lovely facility here. I appreciate it. Um, I'll be brief because uh, a number of the points I was going to hit on have already been touched on. President Romangasal tends to do that when he speaks about conservation. He, he hits all the high points. Um, but I wouldn't be doing my job as an ocean advocate during Ocean Week if I didn't throw a few ocean statistics at you. Um, as you likely know, there's tremendous pressure on global fisheries. In fact, 90% um, of global fisheries are um, either overfished or are fully exploited. Uh, you combine that with pollution and the impacts of climate change, and we have a, a real problem with the health of our oceans. Um, fortunately, there's a growing body of science that shows that very large, fully protected marine reserves are key to rebuilding species abundance and diversity and protecting the overall health of the marine environment. Last November, um, thanks in part to Dr. Earle, uh, the World Parks Congress um, made a strong statement that at least 30 percent of the world's oceans should be protected in marine reserves, and there is emerging science that that number should be um, even higher. Um, President Romain Gassel, you know, knows this well, and what he has proposed with the Palau National Marine Sanctuary is, I think, one of the most innovative uh, sanctuary uh, proposals out there. It split Palau's EEZ into two zones. One would be 80 percent of its EEZ, 500,000 square kilometers, would be a fully protected marine reserve. No commercial fishing no um, extraction of any other resources. The other would be a domestic fishing zone, and that would be um, exclusive for Palauans. Um, it would ban foreign commercial fishing and ban exports to make sure that Palau had fish and the tourism market um, in Palau, which is the lifeblood of its economy, would have fish also. Inevitably, the question is, can this be uh, protected, especially with um, a border with Indonesia, the Philippines, and two high seas pockets? And um, there was a lot of promising information that came out of the um, out of demonstrations that uh, Assistant Secretary McGinn noted. And Pew committed to building upon those demonstrations by hosting a workshop in Palau. We did that this past April. And the goal of that workshop was to come up with a comprehensive strategy and action plan to make sure that the Palau National Marine Sanctuary was protected from illegal fishing. Because if you don't stop fishing, then the uh, marine reserve is only worth the paper that um, it's written on. And so um, we brought together officials from the United States, Australia, um, the Foreign Fisheries Agency, NGOs like Pew, Scripps, and uh, the Nippon Foundation, and most importantly, the relevant Palau um, agencies and uh, ministries um, with, with the local expertise. 
uh, ultimately they are going to have to you know, carry out uh, th this plan. So we're in the process of helping Palau write a comprehensive strategy to um, protect the Palau National Marine Sanctuary. I think while Palau, as you've heard, needs uh, additional resources, there's a lot of promise here. Um, in, in January, Pew helped Palau identify an unauthorized uh, longline vessel using AIS and uh, cross-referencing that with Palau's authorized vessel list. Um, the Mar Palau Marine Law Enforcement was able to deploy its patrol vessel, catch it within 10 miles before it escaped into the Indonesian um, across the border and brought it back to port and found that it was full of yellowfin tuna and over 300 sharks and um, hundreds of shark fins. Uh, Palau was able to successfully prosecute and find that vessel and the, and the fishing company. Just one example of how it does work. Now there's a lot more um, of those resources that are needed to make sure it works you know, more often and that we uh, protect uh, the Palau National Marine Sanctuary once it's fully effective. So this has been um, a really, um, a real pleasure working with Palau to not only figure out how conservation, but also how um, enforcement can work. And we look forward to uh, finalizing uh, the enforcement plan for the Palau National Marine Sanctuary and figuring out how Palau can leverage its partnerships uh, to make sure that we do protect the Palau National Marine Sanctuary fully. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to kick off uh, some questions. I, I and I'd like to start with one, and then that strikes me that, um, Mr. President, you, you mentioned that um, the environment is your economy, and the economy is the environment, and then security is uh, the environment, and, and the environment is your security. That's really interesting, because I think in the United States, in, in the broader geopolitical uh, uh, discussion about the pivot to Asia or the rebalance to Asia, I think it's dawning on American officials that e economy, e economics, is the foundation of security in Asia. Um, what I wondered is if you or the panel, um, you think about enforcement and thinking about um, how to cover the, these big, big ocean states, as you mentioned, the, the huge swaths of territory. It it's obviously can't be uh, one country uh, trying to enforce that. You've got to have agreement from several countries, from all the countries involved, and several countries probably to start. What regional architecture, uh, what are the, what are the um, what's the possibility of using regional architecture to build alignment and consensus over following the rules and the laws around this issue? Uh, have you thought about that? And, and would, would any of you have comments on that? Uh, let me just uh, start off by saying that the reality of the, the situation is that no one country, including Palau, can ever do it alone. Uh, th this is a gigantic thing that, as I said, uh, can only be success successful if there is a partnership concept to it. Even if you don't catch the IUU vessel in Palau's waters, maybe the next port of uh, stop, uh, like the FSM or the Marshalls or Guam or Saipan, for that matter, which are in, uh, around our region, then you can pursue the you know the ships across the uh, uh, the jurisdiction. Um, even if Palau had uh, ten ships uh, to man, uh, but without the necessary technology involved, the air surveillance and the monitoring and finding out where the exact location of these ships. It's also futile in a way. You need to be efficient by getting to the spot where the illegal activity is happening with the use of uh, marine uh, surveillance and monitoring. And uh, another point is we don't need to invent the wheel on this matter. I think there's examples in Europe, certainly in the United States, around Hawaii, uh, certainly in Japan, where there, if, if the right architecture, as you say, if the right framework is there, then small island uh, nations like Palau can have an effective program. But again, it's all about partnership. Uh, you know, I, I think it's one of those wars that has to be fought on many fronts. And so I think that, again, as the president just said, the in some ways, the hardest piece of the puzzle is getting the enforcement asset right to where the violator is. And um, with technology, we're getting we're going to be better at detection. But if you have a satellite looking down, um, looking down from the sky, that's not the same as being on the water and intercepting a vessel. So, but so we, we need to work on we, we need to work on all of those things. Um, 
there was a recent, there is a re an administration task force on um, IUU fishing and seafood fraud that came out with a set of recommendations um, uh, uh, last December and an implementation plan last February that um, lays out a, a, a few other steps that can reinforce the architecture, which include um, um, implementation of the Port State Measures Treaty by the United States. There's pending legislation now. Um, to, that, would be a, that would be a big step to, again, get the international architecture in place, another baby step to get there. Um, there were also recommendations to take uh, best management practices, including enforcement packet practices, to all of the regional fishery management organizations. And, you know, I think that that will help, help the United States be a forceful advocate for those in all of the regional fishery um, organizations so that we, we, we understand what is legal fishing and what is illegal fishing and we get the, uh, the uh, uh, you know, the, the, the home, um, all, all of our international partners who participate in those fisheries to, to, to uh, undertake to take enforcement actions and recognize that it's necessary. So those are just a few of the steps that we're working on. I, I think uh, that in, in the um, geopolitical realm, certainly um, agreements, treaties that uh, bring assets to bear on this problem are, are very, very important. But I also like to emphasize that uh, across an individual government uh, in the United States, uh, working with NOAA, working with uh, the Department of the Interior, Energy, and, and others, and of course the other services, uh, we are very, very keen to uh, get much more leverage out of the assets we have today. We, we need more, that's recognized, but we are underutilizing the databases, for example, the sensors that are out there today. There are, uh, a, as we speak here in Washington, there are literally thousands of measurements uh, going on throughout the oceans of the world. And in many cases, they're going up uh, stovepipes to databases that aren't aware of other databases. So creating this synergy, this architecture through partnerships of uh, what we know about what is going on in the ocean is really a key step that will bring a lot of leverage. Uh, we um, have partnered for decades, literally, and, and we're strengthening these partnerships all the time with NGOs, for example, where uh, we may have data that is uh, primarily from sensors used for uh, traditional naval missions, but has value for uh, tracking uh, marine mammals, for example, or, or, uh, or fish or, or other assets, and also uh, ocean temperature, ocean salinity. So we want to make sure that uh, we in the Department of the Navy and Department of Defense are getting the kinds of partnerships that there's a two-way flow of information of sensor data, a, uh, a correlation of that sensor data, and really to uh, understand how we can, in fact, bring the most value out of every sensor that is out there so we can, in fact, uh, uh, attack these problems. One other comment, uh, keying off what Eileen said, if you consider uh, the value chain of an illegal fishing enterprise, uh, certainly, uh, some of that value is created where the fish are, are harvested, but uh, as the President pointed out, even if you don't get somebody in Palawan waters, if they in fact escape over the border, if you know and you have evidence that they were there and that they illegally fished, you can go after them in port states or you can go up the value chain. Uh, and I think one, one uh, point here. We've got to make sure that we are starting to attack the demand side of illegal fishing. There is terrible, terrible waste and unsustainable practices out there that are trying to uh, meet the demand of uh, exotic tastes that uh, no longer have a place in, uh, in a sustainable world. Okay, uh, let's open it up. Uh, question here in the front. And just please introduce yourself. And uh, I'm, I'm we have a microphone here just so that people who are online can also hear your question. Thank you. I'm Matt Rand with the Pew Charitable Trust. Uh, Mr. President, you spoke about the compact agreement. Um, could you explain a little bit more about the agreement with the United States and how that would actually help uh, Palau with conservation in the marine sanctuary? It's basically, uh, as I said, Palau has internal uh, 
con uh, control of its destination, but when it comes to its uh, defense and security, we rely totally on the uh, protection of the United States. Um, we have identified the security as not only the threat of war or aggression, but the threat of our culture, the threat of our economic uh, livelihood, and the, the threat of our survival uh, as a people and as an island nation. And so we would like the, uh, the issue of security to look at it on that, uh, on that uh, role. And uh, it's been said uh, uh, we're the world, our island now is the, the face of uh, climate change, uh, global warming. It's now the face of what's happening if uh, there is no stoppage to these IUU uh, uh, activities out there. So we're really the window of what eventually will happen to the rest of the world if we don't solve the problem where the roots of the problem is occurring. And this is really where we hope the United States takes an active leadership role in the, in the Pacific. We hope our friends from Japan takes an active role in the Pacific in this matter. Australia and New Zealand are there, but it's going to require a total regional uh, cooperation to get to the matter, uh, get to the root of this problem. Uh, thank you. Well, my name is Chuck Fox. I'm with a, a funders collaborative called Oceans Five. And start by saying, President Romengasau, thank you for your leadership. It's something that I think people are seeing throughout the Pacific and throughout the world, and it is uh, really quite remarkable. Um, and uh, the diplomacy with which you answered that last question, I'm assuming that the questioner was hoping that you'd talk about the U.S. paying some of its bills under the compact agreement. But um, I, I will just say that for others. Um, for others' benefit. Uh, but my question is really directed to um, Secretary McGinn, um, and thank you again for the leadership of the Navy. When we think about maritime domain awareness, um, one of the key objectives of this is ultimately deterrence, trying to prevent these actions from happening in the first place. And I, I think as we think this problem through, there's, there's really no way a scenario that I see that we have the capacity to ultimately enforce our way out of this problem. You know, the Palau has one naval vessel, um, no matter how much you've got other jobs to do in the U.S. Navy. Um, and, and my sense is that trying to figure out a better way to provide deterrence to prevent this in the first instance is something that has to be a key objective of ours um, as we go forward with this. My postulation is that public awareness um, could help tremendously to the extent that uh, retailers, wholesalers, the public, um, advocates like we see here in this room today, uh, the media, they have information about vessels, who owns the vessel, what the vessel is doing. That if the extent that this information becomes public, like it is in pollution control or other things in the world, it could be a tremendous value. The Navy's developed this program called Sea Vision, which is doing a lot of this information, but it, right now that information is not public. Um, and the question to you is, um, General McKis McChrystal always talked about the value of having information go public. Would you be willing to consider having Sea Vision and some of these assets that you are developing within the U.S. Navy be made public so that everyone can really understand uh, what vessels are out there doing what? Uh, I, yes, we can. Uh, obviously, uh, there's a balance between uh, the traditional military missions uh, uh, methods and capabilities and capacities that uh, we want to keep for national security purposes very close hold. But uh, that does not prevent us from sharing a lot of uh, other uh, sources of data and, uh, and the products of uh, analysis that come from that data uh, in, in the way that you, uh, that you uh, just outlined. So no, there isn't, and uh, we will in fact uh, be continuing to look at this. Right now we have uh, Admiral uh, Jonathan White, our Naval Oceanographer, uh, who is uh, chairing an effort to uh, develop what we are calling the uh, MDA or Maritime Domain Awareness Plan. And part of that plan will in fact be what kinds of products can we use for what purposes, sharing with, uh, with other nations, sharing with uh, NGO partners, uh, and sharing with the public to have the most effect uh, in, the, in the way that you outlined. Can I just add to that? I'd like to offer uh, something, uh, maybe a public good that, that CSIS can help with here. We, um, we've created in the last year uh, a facility called the uh, Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative, 
or the AMTI. It's a website uh, that, it, that basically pu has pulled in and publicized and made public uh, and transparent um, data on uh, what's happening on the, in the, on the oceans and under the oceans and above the oceans in uh, Asia. Uh, it's been particularly focused on the uh, South China Sea, where fishing is a, also a, a big issue. Um, but we would, um, it's, it's, an, it's the Asia Maritime <laughs> Transparency Initiative. So if there, are, if there is data uh, that you want to share uh, or that governments or individuals want to share, we w I would, I'm a co-director of the effort. I'd be happy to uh, publicize this on the CSIS's uh, AMTI, which is a website open to everybody. Um, I think it's a, in the South China Sea, it has been remarkably helpful in making people aware of what's actually happening. In fact, it was our photos that were on the cover of the New York Times, uh, the, the Chinese reclamation of the islands and dredging of the, uh, they're actually dredging the South China Sea and throwing it up on top of uh, sand uh, to, to make uh, new runways and, and build islands on top of what were previously rocks. So uh, if we can be helpful, uh, Mr. McGinn, we'd be happy to help. That's a great uh, offer. We'll follow up on that, Ernie. I also want to point out uh, fairly recently, about two weeks or so ago, related to the South China Sea and the, uh, the buildup of these uh, islands, the uh, United States Navy flew uh, some anti-submarine uh, warfare maritime domain awareness uh, aircraft, the P-8, uh, with uh, a, a crew from CNN embarked to be able to uh, put out to the, uh, the world's media what was actually going on and the imagery and, and all of the data that came from uh, those flights is, is available. That was, that's one recent example of how we, we really do get it, that uh, we've got to be able to uh, tell a story to many, many audiences uh, in order to have the effect of uh, concern that we want to achieve. So, President Ramingasal, and actually all of you, a question about, Did you identify yourself? I'm sorry, Sylvia Earle with the National Geographic, <laughs> Mission Blue and a great friend of Palau. <laughs> the economy of Palau is largely dependent on tourism as compared to what is derived from the current and perhaps some, any future uh, revenues and the security issues that have been on the table here uh, are focused largely on what we currently know about the waters around Palau. In Palau and globally, what is known about the deep water is, is relatively small compared to what we know about the surface and depths to a few hundred meters. I just wondered to what extent there might be enthusiasm and support for the technologies, not just to go high in the sky, to observe activities in the waters of Palau and beyond, but to be actually to explore and define the areas that are in deep water, which really dominate Palauans exclusive economic zone and much of the Pacific. You know, the figures I hear about what we know about the seafloor itself, it's less than 10% mapped with the same accuracy that we have for the moon and Mars and such. Uh, and it isn't just the bottom, and of course it isn't just the top, it's the ocean itself, the, the juicy part of the EEZ, the, the water and the life that's there and our capacity to really observe, to document, to monitor, to understand. China is investing vigorously in deep sea technology. Part of it has to do with basic exploration. Part of it has to do with an eye toward exploitation of fisheries, of course, but mining as well. Another uh, issue that has not yet been articulated here, the interest that is growing about mining deep waters in, in the Pacific. And so far that hasn't been a major issue, as, at least as I have heard in Palau, but some of your neighboring island countries are really looking hard at the potential 
of revenues that might be derived from the deep water assets. And so I guess the question is how that might factor uh, in the deliberations of security and the economy and the environment of how we might, looking forward, prepare to address the necessary technologies to understand, document, and deal with most of the, the area surrounding Palau. Uh, I'm happy to um, so th I think the good thing about the Palau National Marine Sanctuary, sorry, the good thing about the Palau National Marine Sanctuary um, is that it is a, a fully protected, 80% uh, of the EEZ will be fully protected. Um, so for Palau's purposes, you know, that's extraction of, you know, all resources and that's, uh, um, I think that builds upon Palau's long history of leadership um, in conservation, one of the first nations to ban um, bottom trawling, um, and uh, showing, that shows an understanding of, you know, uh, the importance of the ecosystem from the very bottom uh, to the very top, you know, of, of the water column. Um, last time I was in Palau, um, I, I spoke with a, a marine biologist who thinks that uh, some of the new data coming out about the Palau Trench uh, that it might be deeper than um, initially thought. And um, what just came to my mind when you were saying that, Dr. Earl, is we should get you back there with uh, James Cameron's toys and um, see if it is, in fact, uh, you know, the, the second deepest place you know, on the planet. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Earl, for, for that. I know uh, uh, w there's a lot of focus on land and above the water, but you're right, there is very little known under, uh, under in the deep water. I might just add that National Geography just did a, um, a, uh, a study in Palau recently, and they're going to come out with a film. But uh, in their limited research uh, with their equipment that are able to, you know, get a pictures of life under, uh, in the deepest part of the ocean, there were a lot of undocumented uh, species that, uh, you know, that showed up in the camera. And so that's, uh, uh, again, that would be a great contribution through the marine sanctuary that we also have a chance to look what's underneath the, uh, uh, the uh, protected area. If I may just add this uh, point, because it seems like most people think of a, pro a marine protected area as only benefiting the closed area. But actually, the, the, the great benefit from a marine uh, uh, protected area is the spillover effect that it has on other unprotected areas. And we have proven throughout uh, generations uh, of Palawan fishing traditions that whenever a particular fish is in you know, loss of fish populations, the chiefs would come out and close that particular reef as a no-take zone. And voila, the, they go fishing on some other areas, but the regenerated the closed area has a chance not only to repopulate itself, but the population then spreads onto nearby areas. So, you know, you're talking about inside and outside the, uh, the marine protected area. So this 80% uh, of our exclusive economic zone is not just going to protect Palau, per se. It is going to have an effect on our neighboring Pacific Ocean and the fact that tuna population is, is uh, uh, you know, dying out, the fact that our shark population is dying out in other areas. Um, many of the pelagic fish or the migratory fish are in, in danger of a very low population. So it's, it's this kind of uh, spillover effect that we're asking the world Let's not just have a free-for-all ocean. Let's at least uh, go for a 10%. Whatever shoe fits your area, do it. But there is benefits to spillover benefits from, from everything we do. I, I, I did. I, I really just wanted to, um, to underscore your point, Dr. Earl, which is we, we know so little about these areas. We know that they're... We know that they are rich in many resources, but the details and, and every, every, it seems like every minute of research time that we invest, the, the amount of return in terms of knowledge, un, previously undocumented knowledge is just immense. Um, and yet, and, and, and part of, for instance, the uh, rationale for expanding the, the uh, U.S. Uh, Marine Pacific monuments recently was to um, 
to develop a body of research to, to really document the kinds of effects that you were talking about, Mr. President. And um, um, uh, it's w one thing that's really scary is, you know, we, we pride ourselves at NOAA in having um, a small fleet of research vessels to do all kinds of this ocean research. Um, and our, ves our vessels, it's an aging, it's a small aging fleet. And our ability to go out there and mine this knowledge, not necessarily the resources, but the knowledge, um, decreases every day. We have in the President's budget this year the budget for um, a NOAA research white ship, and there is not a lot of momentum behind that proposal. We've actually timed um, our requests very carefully to dovetail with the Navy's research vessel program to try to be um, what, what people say they want, which is, you know, a, a, an efficient, cost-effective, uh, budget-conscious um, government, if we kind of get out of sync with the Navy production of vessels, they, our NOAA vessels will cost a lot more. Um, we've had, um, we do, we have had some, um, some really cool Pacific um, voyages of, with, with NOAA research vessels recently, and we're just, we're really excited about what we're finding. We can't do it very often, given how few resources we have. When you, when you look at the number of assets that the United States has for this kind of research versus other other countries, I think people would be surprised to see how far we down how far down we are in the list. We are not the preeminent researchers that we used to be in this field. I think it's probably the right time for me to ask. You know, CSIS tries to drive towards a policy agenda in our work. Um, I, I wanted to just ask the panel. You know, what are the top two things the United States should do uh, to support? Uh, Palau and, and their efforts. Uh, somebody mentioned before the um, the money that's owed, uh, but I, I wanted to ask, you know, Mr. President, you you, you are very diplomatic, but it, could you be <laughs> could you be blunt with us for a moment? <laughs> it, uh, what what can we do to help specifically from a policy perspective? Just pivot into the Pacific. <laughs> I mean, we have a presence there. Right. You know, just a small point that I forgot to say. Uh, underwater drones. Mm -hmm. yeah. They've been using that to relocate the sunken ships and, you know, being, uh, to be able to get uh, the remains of uh, U.S. Uh, soldiers back to the U.S. And that's a technology that actually has been uh, helpful in uh, getting pictures of underwater uh, s uh, submerged corals and, and getting a, a picture of what is happening out there. So a technology that came for the purpose of relocating remains of World War II actually has uh, contributed much to what science is finding out about uh, underwater, uh, although they don't go as deep as it is. But that's a, a great way of uh, you know, merging the technology and the work that is available now to do further work that really needs to be out there. But if I can be very blunt, uh, you know, we are very proud to say that Palau is the United States' closest friend and ally for small islands in the Pacific. The reality is that the other countries are aggressively coming into the region, whether it's economy, whether it's uh, fishing, whether it's territorial claims, whether it's uh, um, uh, addressing partnerships uh, with the region. And so this is, a, I talked with Senator McCain this morning, and I said, please, um, let's see some, let's showcase the pivot into the Pacific. Let's showcase the partnership and the leadership that needs to be there. Uh, because while we're talking about this, uh, efforts are made every day that may be, be very costly uh, at a later date. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment on that? Uh, we just uh, had a change of uh, command uh, that uh, gave me a great deal of confidence in our leadership in, uh, in uh, the United States uh, forces. Uh, Admiral Harry Harris, who's been for a couple of years now the commander of the United States Navy's Pacific Fleet, is now the overall commander of uh, the Pacific Command. Uh, we just uh, had uh, the Pacific Fleet taken over by uh, Admiral Scott Swift, who was a former uh, seventh Fleet Commander. So uh, just on using those uh, two individuals with tremendous amount of knowledge and experience at sea and working with all of the nations uh, in the, especially in the Western Pacific, uh, we've got some leaders that really understand this linkage between national security, environment, economy, and, uh, and the need to uh, prevent uh, illegal activities. So uh, I'm encouraged that uh, we have that kind of leadership 
Uh, we talk with them uh, on a regular basis, and uh, we will continue that conversation and uh, try to bring some uh, detailed uh, plans to, uh, to uh, the present uh, from uh, what we have learned from the pilot program, for example, on the MDA, but also in every other dimension of partnership, not just inside the Department of Defense, but with, uh, with other organizations and nations as well. Panel, um, does it matter that the United States has not signed UNCLOS? Uh, should we sign that? Yes, 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 yes. We should. And 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 I just uh, I am amazed at someone who has uh, served 35 years uh, in the uniform of the United States Navy and many years since uh, working in various fields. Why we cannot get our act together to sign that? And I know that uh, this great leader. Senator John Warner uh, has been uh, laboring in that vineyard for many, many years, and uh, we just need to get on with it. It, it. it makes so much common sense. There's no downside, and uh, I, I strongly, strongly encourage, as does the chairman of the uh, Joint Chiefs, the secretaries of defense, and, the, and all of the services, let's get on and, uh, and sign UNCLOS. Senator, any chance we can get you to say a word about that? Josh, could you get him a, a microphone? Well, it's very interesting. Uh, I've, I've worked on this since I was Secretary of the Navy back in 1971, two, three, four. Um, it's, it's extremely puzzling, but they liken it to Woodrow Wilson's 14 points and how he was uh, going to undercut the possible sovereign rights of this nation by promulgating uh, that epical document. And that aura still hangs in up there. Uh, it's a mystique. But I do believe, uh, and you might say to my good friend, if John McCain got into afterburner, it might happen. <laughs> That's a scary thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, now I'd love to take your question here in the second row. Thank you. Um, I'm Karen Sack from Ocean Unite, which is a, an initiative to build ocean conservation decisions through amplifying voices and, and driving conservation action. Um, and your question, Mr. Bauer, is, is something I'd like to address. Um, in the early 2000s, when I'm going to shift to a different ocean, I'm afraid, um, when the issue of piracy arose in Somalia, the stories go that uh, it arose because of illegal fishing in the Somalian EEZ uh, by distant water fleets uh, that were stealing the fish. And the Somali fishers, the local fishers, went out and actually one of the first vessels um, that uh, was pirated was a fishing vessel. When they realized that there wasn't that much value from a fishing vessel, they went after uh, more high value vessels. And the international community uh, as soon as it became oil tankers and uh, container ships came together, uh, put a lot of money and effort and assets into identifying what was going on, navies working together, technology being applied to combat that maritime security issue across the region. How about using some of the knowledge learned from the application of those assets, uh, the, the human capacity and the technology to look at what's going on in the Pacific in particular. Uh, we have the leadership of a, a great president uh, through President Romain Gasal um, and others in the Pacific who are, are, are asking for help on this issue. Um, it isn't just about fish, uh, although for some of us fish are really important. Um, it's about that national security and some of those lessons could really be learned for not, you know, uh, uh, kind of used for not very much money um, and those partnerships already exist. So moving from the Indian Ocean across to a Pacific pivot again could be a, a, an interesting thing to do. Thanks. A great comment. Um, anybody want to address that? You know, why not fishing and why not the Pacific? What, what's the, why not? Why, why are we not responding? Seth? 
Uh, let me put you on the spot here. Sure. Uh, <laughs> I don't have an answer. Why not? Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, working with Palau, it's it's clearly a threat, um, in, and there are um, fishermen who have been detained sitting in Palau, you know, right now that that they have to deal with, um, and. <clears throat> it, it is clearly um, a, a threat beyond illegal fishing uh, for Palau, and the President mentioned the other transnational crimes that um, are, are problems. And, and uh, you know, having the, the porous borders that Palau does have with Indonesia and the Philippines and two high seas pockets, um, it, it, it's not just about fishing. It shouldn't just be about fishing. And so we shouldn't just deploy, um, you know, fishing, uh, illegal fishing enforcement assets to it. We should be deploying more assets to it. A uh, question here in the in the back. Uh, this will be our last question. Thank you. I'm Tom Kisano, visiting fellow of the GSIS. I have two questions. Uh, thank you very much for the High Excellency, the President. Uh, the Majesty's Japanese Emperor and Empress visited Palau and uh, got very uh, warm hospitality. Uh, it's uh, broadcasted as good news, and many Japanese people were moved and engraved by the Palau's very good uh, image. So would you tell me about the uh, current and the future relationship between the Palau and Japan? This is the first question. And the second one is that uh, Chinese Navy's uh, presence and uh, power is getting stronger and, and stronger, especially in the uh, Southeast Asia, uh, China Seas. And uh, uh, they seem to go forward to Pacific Ocean. So uh, how do you assess Chinese Navy and the Chinese uh, forces? On the first question, let me just say to, uh, this year was the 70th anniversary of the end of the World War II in the famous barrel of Peliliu uh, and, and, of course, throughout the uh, Pacific. So we were very uh, honored that the, uh, His Majesty the Emperor and the Empress uh, took the time to come and uh, really not only pray for the souls of the, the soldiers uh, of the war, but preach the message of... Uh, of um, of, um, of peace, of uh, n learning our lessons from the tragedies of World War II and, and really solving the international conflicts through uh, peaceful resolutions. And I think that was a very important uh, message and very much supported by the peaceful countries of the Pacific. Uh, we, we went through a terrible, terrible uh, uh, part of our history during the war. And we're very happy that Japan and the United States are actually the ones taking the leadership in making sure that it's a peaceful uh, uh, century for us, uh, not just in the Pacific, but throughout the, the, uh, the world. And so on that, that is the same spirit that I want to address these uh, also uh, jurisdiction uh, overlapping and, and conflicts and uh, aggressive uh, uh, illegal fishing activities that are coming into our world. I hope that uh, we continue to address this in a peaceful manner, but uh, it comes down to respect. That's the key word, that uh, respect should not be because the big boys or the small boys respect the big boys, it should be a vice versa. The big boys have to also respect the small boys. If we can all be respectful, then this world will be a lot better place to live in. I can't think of a better note to close our conference on. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. President.